Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing. Projects discussed on the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. GMGM, GM. hi, and welcome back to another episode of Punkcast. Today we're back with Punk5309 with two Addies, wild hair and punkish cigarette. In real life, he's one of the brightest minds and investors in Web3. He's currently the head of crypto at Wonderstruck venture partner at Maverick Capital, and also a ventures member at Punk Dow. Please welcome Jack Sun to the show. Jack, how are you, man? Good. Hey, Max. Appreciate the intro. Glad to be here. Yeah, nice. Uh, nice to finally um, connect and speak. I know um, we've been uh, DJing together in uh, Telegram group chats and Discord, so it's, uh, it'd be finally great to, um, to unpack your story. Yeah, 100%. So maybe we could just start with the, the general question I ask everybody on the show. Um, what's, what's the story behind your handle, HH Jax? Yeah, I guess my, my answer is pretty boring. It just literally stands for kind of my full name. Uh, Jack is nickname, moniker that I came up with when I uh, first immigrated to the States. And my like second grade teacher asked me, you know, what's your English name? Uh, and then HH just stands for my full Chinese name, which is uh, Hanbui. Okay, nice. Well, why don't you tell us about your, your background and your journey? I think um, maybe we start from there and then um, we, can, we can sort of wander into the, the world of crypto. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Um, so super high level, starting from the beginning, uh, first generation immigrant, uh, moved to LA when I was around uh, seven and a half. I uh, went to school in California, uh, UCSB, uh, moved around a bit and then got into crypto in 2018, initially uh, at a stablecoin company called Trust Token, ended up helping them launch their uh, lending market product, which was called uh, TrueFi. Left the company shortly after, worked on a perp dex, uh, joined a fund. Uh, the fund was single LP by Eric Schmidt, it was called Steel Perlow, it was essentially his like Web3 family office, and now head of crypto at Wonderstruck, where we do design product and brand strategy for a lot of the uh, top Web3 brands in the space. Nice. All right. Well, let's break some of that down. So um, immigrant from China. Uh, where, whereabouts in China is your family from? Yeah, uh, southern China, uh, Yunnan. Uh, I don't think there's a ton of us here in the States, especially like my hometown. It's pretty like uh, like countryside, rural. Um, but yeah, it's like it borders Vietnam. You can always cross over uh, on foot into Hanoi from my hometown. Oh, nice. You can, are you fluent in Chinese and languages? Yeah, Kei <laughs> Zhang <laughs> I, I, I admit my, my Chinese is terrible. I did live in Shanghai for a little bit, um, but also obviously based in Hong Kong now, but um, Cantonese and Mandarin is probably non-existent. And as, as an immigrant in, in the US, like, what was that like? Was it an easy sort of journey for you, sort of settling in and assimilating? Uh, definitely not. I, I think I had like a pretty like volatile, I guess, like upbringing post-immigration. Just because I, I think it's like a typical story, right? Uh, financial struggles, uh, living in an area where, you know, it was predominantly uh, just like non-Asian. Uh, I remember elementary school, my first elementary school here in the U.S., I was, I think, quite literally the only Asian person uh, in my whole school. So, you know, <laughs> uh, typical stories of like bullying, struggling with language. I, I think I was lucky, though. Um, I've always loved reading. Uh, and I think like language and uh, kind of like soft skills have always been my strong point versus uh, like being super technical uh, or deep on the math side. So was able to pick up English fairly quickly. Uh, it, it's actually kind of funny. I, I learned English mostly through a combination of uh, Mormon missionaries and also uh, listening to a lot of 90s hip hop. So <laughs> learned all the bad words from 90s hip hop and <laughs> learned proper English, I guess, from the Mormon missionaries. You, you, know, you know what's funny? I, I can totally relate. My, so, my, so my family uh, is is Vietnamese by background, and so they were like the refugee boat people that came over from Vietnam to to Perth. And um, you know, I'm the youngest of six, and we we didn't, you know, very poor sort of immigrant family that came over. And uh, my parents 
I don't know, they, they found these Jehovah's Witnesses as friends and, um, and they sort of said, look, we can come over on Sundays and teach your kids Bible studies. Yep. And my parents are like, yep, that's cool. Um, that, that basically, that basically is a free English tuition on, on Sundays for the kids basically. So <laughs> we're very, very, very similar backgrounds and uh, story there and growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, awesome. And then, and then, so you, so you learned English, you sort of had some of the Asian sort of struggles that, that most people do as well. well what did you study at uh, UCSB? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's almost easier to try to list off what I didn't study because I, I change majors like quite often. I, I started off as a comp sci major uh, a year in, wasn't taking it seriously enough, ended up switching out to econ accounting and then dropped the accounting, was just doing econ. And then my senior year ended up uh, switching to communications and just finished that like in one year, graduated with the uh, Bachelor of Arts. And yeah, that, that was uh, basically the end of my schooling. Oh, nice. And then, and then how did you get yourself into, um, into Trust Token? Yeah, so I started off my career post-college more, I would say, on the TradFi side or TradFi like tech adjacent. Initially at a company called Thomson Reuters. Uh, they're quite old. It's like similar to Bloomberg. We were like an enterprise data provider to a lot of the uh, trading shops, uh, the different uh, commodity companies. And there was when I first, I guess, uh, got my first taste of like the, the world of of finance, of banking, et cetera. Uh, then went on to work at a uh, private equity tech company called Juniper Square. And that was in, based in SF. And I actually, I was reached out to by one of, at that time, one of the co-founders of Trust Token, his name was Tori. Uh, him and I just kind of hit it off and uh, there was an opportunity to leave Juniper Square, leave the Web2 stuff behind and come into Trust Token and uh, be his like right-hand man as they try to pivot the company from uh, initially this like stablecoin issuance uh, company to potentially something more uh, consumer oriented. And, and yeah, that's kind of how I got into Trust Token uh, back in 2018, 2019. Oh, nice. And just going back a second as well, I know you sort of jumped around around your decisions around um, your majors at university. What, why, were you, why were you jumping around so much, do you think? Like from ComSci to Econ Accounting to Econ Communications, like what, what sort of... Um, drove you around those decisions? Yeah, I think I've just always been naturally curious. Uh, that's one. And really didn't know uh, what I wanted to do. So one, wanted to like, get a taste and, and try everything. But also more realistically, it was also uh, like I, I had too many extracurricular activities. Maybe my first like uh, three years of college where school was just not the main priority for me. Uh, I was running you know, some side businesses with friends where we were reselling things uh, from like Chinese factories, from Taobao, uh, here in the U.S., and like going to different expos, going to different uh, like festivals to sell these things, and and that was more my priority, uh, along with kind of partying along alongside the business, uh, <laughs> rather than like going to school, attending classes. I'm pretty sure like my first two years, I for most of my classes, I attended the first day uh, to make sure that you know they didn't kick me out, and then I attended class for midterms and finals. And those would be like the three times that I go to class the whole year. <laughs> well, it sounds very punkish already, um, or already being a bit of a rebel. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Awesome. And then, um, so your first taste of, was that your first taste of crypto in 2018 when you joined um, Trust Token? Uh, I would actually say first taste of crypto was probably 2015, 2016. Uh, it was when, you know, I had, you know, first gone to college. I'm kind of a taste of freedom just because uh, growing up with like pretty traditional Chinese parents, they were like fairly strict on me uh, throughout like middle school, high school. So college was really the first taste of freedom, kind of went maybe a little too wild. And uh, my personal like first taste in crypto was actually exploring the dark web and, you know, trying to uh, buy like a fake ID or a bit of weed uh, yeah, on like Alpha Bay uh, and these different like uh, renditions of the Silk Road website. Um, and yeah, back then was buying like, I remember BTC on Circle and then sending it to some mixer uh, and then trying to make a transaction on these websites. Wow. So what, so what was the dark web like to use back then? Was it easy to sort of set up and um, buy things? And what, what kinds of things could you sort of get? I mean, you, you talk about sort of fake IDs and things like that, but. Um... Yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't touched it in a while, but from 
memory, it, it was like fairly simple. You, you know, had to set up Tor, you set up a VPN, uh, and you, you know, tried to acquire uh, some uh, BTC or uh, it was usually BTC at the time. Like I, I think Litecoin was also around, but most people still transacted in Bitcoin. Um, got some, tried to get, acquire some clean Bitcoin and it, it was a fairly like manual process where there's usually some sort of escrow and yeah, a bunch of like listings on uh, a pretty, I don't know, like web one looking uh, website that's like slow to load. Um, it was everything from fake IDs to yeah, the typical run of the mill, like drugs as well. Did you? Oh, but, but how would they just, would they just like, would they just like send it to your mailbox or? Yeah. Yeah. They would quite literally just uh, send it to the mailbox. <laughs> Shit. Okay. I oh, mean, wild times. Right. So, so then you, so you worked at Thompson Reuters. What was Juniper Square? What was that company? Yeah. Juniper Square was uh investment management software. Uh, so basically like a LP portal with a couple more features um, that also doubled as like a, a data room for uh, the private equity space, which at that time was still running mostly on spreadsheets. I think Juniper Square has actually gotten a decent amount of adoption. They, they have something crazy like uh, I think more than like a t maybe like 10, 20 billion uh, AUM in terms of like the funds that are uh, like managing their portfolio on top of Juniper Square. But yeah, it, it's basically just software for uh, these different real estate funds to be able to communicate uh, deal opportunities and also deal updates uh, with their investors. Gotcha. Okay. So then you, you got into the dark web, you first tasted Search Crypto. That would have been like 20. Like early, right? 16, 17 ish. Yeah, it was like between 2014 and 2016, I want to say. Like, I distinctly remember one of the tokens I was trading at the time. Back then, it was still just like looking at threads on uh, 4chan and, and Reddit. It was uh, AntShare, uh, which later rebranded into NEO, the, the uh, Ethereum of, uh, of China that was yeah, getting Chinese, pushed yeah. pretty hard back in mm -hmm. those days. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I distinctly remember trading that coin and paying off some college that with the profits there. But back then it wasn't very deep. Like I, I was, I guess, just, you know, shit coining on centralized uh, exchanges and uh, buying Bitcoin to try to get like fake IDs. Um, not, not too deep into the tech at that point. Do, do you mind me asking you what you were buying the fake IDs for? Uh, I think it was just to like go out to clubs uh, <laughs> as people do back then <laughs> uh, before I was oh, so 21. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. And what did you make of crypto back then? Was it just more of a, a means just to play on Silk Road and the like? Did you, did, I guess the, the crypto fundamentals and foundations really hit you and get, did you get red pilled at, at, uh, at that early in the, in the, in the game? No. So I, uh, to me, it was just a means to end a way to, you know, get the end, the end product of what I wanted, which at the time was my fake IDs. I don't think I got red pill till after I joined Trust Token, really. Uh, cause I got my, I would say like my, my fundamental knowledge there and my, my schooling really there from, uh, the colleagues and some of the co-founders that were there at the time. Yeah. Nice. Well, do you want to talk a little bit about your, your journey at Trust Token, you know, what that is and how you got started there? I mean, I used to use them, uh, back in the day, but I think they closed off the off ramps. Um, but to me, it was a really great way to get on ramp and off ramp with, with some size and, uh, limited sort of slippage, right? Um, but yeah, it's a bit of a shame. I can't, I can't get off anymore or can't get on now. Yeah. 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 Happy to share a bit about trust token. It, it was a, honestly a great first step for me into crypto and, uh, really kind of where I cut my teeth. Uh, when I started there, uh, they were still predominantly running the stable coin business and the thesis had been, uh, before they started, you know, uh, there was only tether and it was essentially a black box. No one really knew how much, uh, actual fiat was backing. Uh, the tether supply and the idea was that trust token to usd would be the first us based uh stablecoin startup and they raised from really good folks from like founders fire and a16z uh, some other us based uh web3 and web2 investors and for a while it was fairly successful uh, i think for a good time we were always within like the top three top five uh stable coins but i think past like you know 2020 2021 uh they just realized that there, there was no beating uh, USDC because of the distribution that they had with Circle and we needed to pivot. And that's kind of around the time uh, where I joined, where we had started to realize that 
you know, uh, perhaps we're not going to win out at the, at the stablecoin business and we need to figure out what else is there for us to do uh, to kind of uniquely claim as ours as a moat. Uh, so we explored some consumer applications. Uh, I, you know, worked with Visa, had gotten us into this like Visa fast track program. And we had thought about essentially launching an anchor like app where we would offer a yield baked into TUSD. Um, but it wouldn't be like 40% or anything crazy like that. It would have been uh, something more stable, like a 10 to 15% yield. Um, so that was one idea that we had explored, uh, had found some partnerships for it, had, you know, done some branding, um, got the mobile app shipped, but ultimately decided the, uh, just the op opportunity wasn't big enough because uh, I think that's when DeFi summer rolled around and, uh, being at like a stable phone company that still had relatively high, like, uh, market cap, uh, I had an opportunity to speak to a lot of the DeFi 1.0 founders early on. Uh, so yeah, Michael Akurv, Sonny from Aave, because they all wanted stablecoin liquidity uh, on their protocol at that time. And basically got, I, I guess, like a head start to uh, to this whole DeFi craze that popped off in, in 2021. And that's when we also decided at Trust Token to, to pivot to the DeFi side and launched TrueFi, which was a under collateralized uh, lending protocol, uh, similar to Maple, where we were mostly just lending to uh, like crypto traders, market makers uh, that had like a history of minting and re redeeming USDC with us. So we had an idea of like what their balance sheet looks like. Uh, and then I left the company uh, after we attained like some success on the TrueFi side. I think we got to at peak maybe like 250 or 500 mil TVL. Uh, I left the company at that time, mostly due to the fact that uh, they decided to sell the IP to, to USD to Justin Sun, uh, which I think now is like public knowledge because uh, <laughs> TUSD has like been delisted on uh, like many exchanges and we've seen some like uh, ir irregularities uh, as far as like the, the mint redeem uh, on chain history uh, for TUSD. Uh, and I left the company at that time, one, because like, I, I one just didn't really want to associate with Justin. I, I didn't think it was uh, necessarily the right decision. And then two more like personally and selfishly, I was the one uh, Chinese person at the company that was investor facing and customer facing and uh, like partner facing. And my last name is also Sun. So I would get like a ton of weird questions, you know, like, hey, Jack, how much did you get out of this deal? Like, how, how did you close Justin on this? I'm like, I, I don't even know him. I've never talked to the guy. So I, I got out of there pretty quickly after that. Are you guys related? Like, oh, funny. Hilarious. Did, did you get, did you ever get to meet Justin? Uh, not while I was at Trust Token. Like we interfaced, I think, with some of his team members when the deal was getting done, and I was still kind of wrapping up my time at the company. But I, I personally never uh, like chatted with him. Ah, uh, didn't uh, didn't didn't know that. So Justin bought the IP to Trust Token. Not so. Is it is that Archblock or is that different? Uh, it's different now. I, I believe Archblock is like a wholly separate entity, and it's it's like technically not Justin that bought uh, to USD either. It's like another you know Chinese uh, subsidiary. But I, I believe all of this um, has been kind of like uh, outlined and like detailed chronologically by the MakerDAO folks. Um, so if folks are curious, you can kind of go to the MakerDAO forums, look up uh, like to USD Justin Sun, and there's like a couple threads about. Uh, like what exactly went on and kind of how that triggered the recalibration in terms of like risk parameters for TUSD as collateral for a lot of these DeFi protocols and later the centralized exchanges as well. Gotcha. And then what uh, what led you to, or what led you to your, your role at Wonderstruck and, and uh, Maverick Capital? Maybe we can talk about Wonderstruck first. What, what is it and, and uh, what's your sort of role there? Yeah, so uh, Wonderstruck is primarily a uh, creative studio uh, that works with a lot of the you know top Web3 projects in the space, whether it's Sui, Han Ventures, Starknet, Jito, or more recently, uh, Ethos, uh, Ostium, Sofamon. Those are all clients of ours. And we do quite literally uh, everything except backend development. So anything from like brand strategy, logo creation, to website design and development, uh, actual like product design and development, we handle. Um, and lately we've done a bit more in terms of like the advisory and incubation side. 
So this year, uh, we've worked with guys like Frame, Nim Network, and Nil Foundation on the advisory side, mostly on like go to market and uh, free TGG advisory. And then on the incubation side, we partnered with uh, Jason over at Folius Ventures to launch Big Club, which is a Web3 investment forum. Uh, we've just announced another project that we incubated called Marginal, uh, which is going to launch on Base and Verichain. It's a physically settled uh, perp decks. And uh, the third one that we launched with some longtime partners of ours is uh, Bazaar. It's uh, similar to Fjord. It's a like public IDO uh, LPB platform. Um, and for us, we're, we're really looking to, you know, both work with, uh, folks that are long-term oriented and kind of share the same ethos as us in the space on uh, the client side with Wonderstruck, but also, uh, try to build out like a, a, a full suite, uh, of like DeFi and consumer crypto tooling on our side. Anything that, you know, we personally feel like is missing in the, in the space or is a gap in the space, uh, we want to try and, you know, find competent, uh, and talented builders to partner with and kind of build out on our own. It's amazing. Um, and there's just some, uh, some really huge projects you work with. Um, I, I mean, Jito is, uh, I mean, when you mentioned Jito, that's a, that's a huge one. So you guys did all the, um, the creative and brand design around that and help them sort of, uh, get to where they are as well. So that's pretty, that's pretty huge. Yeah. Yeah. Jito, I would say is probably like a, a flagship client at this point. We've been them, we've been with them since nearly day one. So. Almost everything you see on the Jito website, uh, the app, the points program, uh, things posted on the Twitter, like all creatives are uh, either us or we had like a hand in it. Oh, amazing. Um, and, and then what about Maverick Capital? What, what is that? And, and I guess what's your, what's your sort of role there? Yeah, with Maverick, uh, I'm a venture partner. I share deals with them that, you know, fit their uh, internal fund thesis and uh, just get a share of carry if deals get done there. Um, I basically, it's, it's a funny story. I, I reached out to C Mail, the GP and founder of Maverick, uh, kind of on a cold DM on Twitter after reading some of the, uh, writing that they had published, uh, when they first started Maverick Capital around, you know, what their thesis is, what they wanted to invest in, just because I, I feel like it was fairly aligned with my own thoughts and how I wanted to, you know, invest, advise, and also uh, build in the space. Um, C Mail and Maverick is super smart guy, uh, ex Bridgewater, uh, I think was more so on like the macro side prior at Bridgewater and started up, uh, Maverick mainly as like a, I believe a liquid prop fund, uh, with like ventures side pockets. And with them, I've done a couple deals so far. I think most notably would be like delegate cop cash, uh, we did together and also, uh, uh, help them with like a investment into Hydra DAO as well. The, uh, DAO of DAOs, uh, that invest in incubates and other, uh, uh, sector specific investment DAOs. Um, but yeah, that, that's a bit about Maverick and kind of how I work with them. Yeah, I read some of his stuff. Um, it's quite it's quite insightful as well uh, around the space and I guess the principles that he's got. And then what was your first NFT? What, so what led you into NFTs? Yeah, I, I love this question because I, I think to a certain extent, NFTs almost, I would say NFTs and tokens were uh, like equal for me in terms of like catalysts and hopping full-time uh, into the crypto uh, crypto rabbit hole. Uh, the first NFT for me was hash masks and I was buying on the bonnet curve. I, I didn't know what I was doing at all. It just, I, I stumbled upon it uh, on Twitter by chance, uh, minted a couple, thought it was cool, started seeing other groups talk about it and minted a bunch more. And that was really the first big uh, NFT one for me. Nice. Uh, when, when was that? Uh, I want to say that that might be like 20... 19, 2020, like really, really early on. And then how did you find your way into, um, into punks? What's that story? Yeah. Yeah. For, uh, for punks, I, I have to shout out, uh, Peter Pan over at one KX for that. Um, a after trust token, I worked at a one KX Porco, uh, that was building like a peer to, uh, pool AMM, uh, prediction market. And Peter was one of our lead investors. So we would have, you know, uh, monthly, weekly sync ups sometimes. And he was the one that really shilled me on, on CryptoPunks. Uh, I think one year before, either before ETH Denver or uh, one of the the DAO conferences uh, in in Denver, he he just what was adamant that like, I need to buy a CryptoPunk. So I think I bought my first one done for maybe like two and a half, three ETH. Uh, and that was the the first step into the punk world. And um, so where did, 
where did you go with that? Is it, is it the one that you have now, or is it was it? No, it's one? not. Yeah, so I I I bought a Beanie Punk uh, initially, but at that time I was such a noob that I didn't even understand like the difference between the traits, and I bought like a female Beanie Punk. So I had that for a while, uh, and then as like kind of got more ingrained into the space, uh, kind of cut my teeth with like the DeFi guild farming and all of that. Uh, got more savvy, made a bit of money, and came back and bought my second punk, which is the wild hair I have now, uh, I think for around like 10, 15 ETH. Those beanie punks are super valuable, man. Did you, um, did you make a good flip on that one? Oh, sorry. Uh, not, not beanie. I, I misspoke. It was a knitted cap. Oh, knitted cap. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and then what, do, you know, do you remember why you, you picked out a uh, knitted cap or punk at the time? Or was it just... Um... It was a floor buy, honestly, okay. at the time. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I like two to two to three ETH at that time was a good chunk of change for me, and I like really didn't understand NFTs at the time. Uh, so it was uh, it was kind of a faith based purchase, and just kind of bought the floor and uh, hope for the best. So, so you sold out, and then what made you get back in at ten fifteen ETH with um, Punk five three oh nine? So I actually uh, bought. Um, the second punk when I was still holding the knitted cap. Uh, I liquidated the knitted, knitted cap at some point, I think in the bear market to uh, just have a bit more liquidity and take care of some things. Um, but yeah, was was always like pretty bullish, uh, even in the last NFT uh, bull market last cycle on punks. And um, so your, your punk 5309, of all the traits you sort of picked, uh, like how did you end up with the cigarette and the bald hair? Uh, yeah. so. Two things like I I don't like doing my hair, so uh, my hair is pretty wild in the morning, and it's it's I guess just more uh, <laughs> natural looking to me. Uh, and then the cigarette, uh, I think at the time when I purchased the pulp, which was probably you know leading up to the bull cycle, I was like smoking uh, quite a lot uh, just because <laughs> of like <laughs> how little I was sleeping at that time. Yeah, I remember the time. That's uh, kind of crazy. Were you engaging much with? The punk community at the time yeah and you know i i was uh in the punk discord and i think back in those days there was actually quite a bit of alpha uh in the in the punk discord uh people would drop you know mints early art blocks alpha early and the punks discord is how i got into art blocks as well ended up like minting quite a few score goals quite a few fidenzas uh didn't sell them at the top uh <laughs> uh unfortunately but that was still a good experience. Uh, got some profit out of it, and still holding a few of those as well. Yeah, nice, man. I um, I, I remember those days. That there, there was that was like the 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 where all the alpha came from, right? In those chats. So as soon as something was being, you know, spoken about or shilled, I mean, you can sort of see literally see the floors moving as the discussion was going on. Um, it's uh, changed changed a lot since. Um, and then. What was your sort of journey into, I guess, DAOs? Because I know you've got, um, uh, you know, you're participating in sort of many DAOs. Um, I think I've sort of seen your your uh, CV, you know, GCR, Hydro Ventures, Steel DAO, and obviously um, uh, Punk Ventures as well with the uh, with the fellow punks. But um, I guess what sort of um, sort of triggered, I guess, your your journey into DAOing? Yeah. So for me, um, crypto was really eye-opening because, you know, I, I went to UCSB. It's not really a, a target school for a lot of these, I guess, like private equity, uh, banking, management consultant routes. And when I started working at Trust Token and started interfacing with a lot of these uh, VCs, I just got curious, right? Like, uh, how does a token come to market? What, you know, how, how do these companies form? What's the process? What is the point of like raising venture capital? I had all of these questions. I uh, didn't really have too many answers, didn't really have uh, folks like around me or like a really specific mentor that was like uh, teaching me these things. So for me, the the best way to learn at that point was uh, DAOs. I was able to find GCR, I think just through Twitter uh, or through like a friend's recommendation and bought some of their token, uh, started seeing uh, some of the deal flow, started seeing the ways that like the community members and the contributors would uh, basically put together these deal memos, run these diligence call, diligence calls, and got my first taste at uh, kind of like the uh, investor slash analyst uh, role on the crypto venture side. And 
uh, I was pretty hooked. Uh, it was really interesting to me. I like, you know, working with early stage founders. I like helping people, uh, you know, through the idea maze and trying to go from like zero to a hundred or zero to one, sorry, in this case. Uh, so just got addicted to participating in DAOs because it felt like it was the one way for me to acquire uh, like an insider network and also insider knowledge without really being an insider. And I think that's one of like the great things about these DAOs as well. Like uh, I was able to kind of like rub shoulders with uh, GPs, associates, partners at all of these different funds that I had only uh, kind of read about or heard about uh, through Twitter. And it was a great like learning experience for me. Hmm. Absolutely. I, I mean, um, Punk Benches is the, the only DAO that I'm probably active in, but um, I guess just being able to sort of see uh, and hear, I guess, uh, I guess the cohort of people in there is is quite unique, right? I think you get a, a lot of diverse views, a lot of um, different professionals from around the world, and and people are sourcing deals globally as well, um, which which you can't really do in sort of a local sort of space like for me here in Hong Kong. So, so yeah, it's a it's a pretty interesting thing, and and in particular, what why, what sort of got you into Punk Dell or Punk Ventures? Uh, yeah, I, I had always been interested in uh, the various like Tribute Lab styles from uh, the Lao, uh, which is actually, I, I believe, like an investor in one of the companies that I used to uh, work at, Flamingo, uh, Spaceship Dow, et cetera. And uh, I think it was just right place, right time. Uh, Punk Dow seemed to be like forming at the time. Uh, I, I felt like fairly early. I saw a couple folks um, in the Discord early on that, you know, I felt like they were pretty serious about making Punk Dow a success and uh, pushing it to be, you know, somewhat unique beyond uh, just being another like Tribute Labs investment DAO that invests in token projects. So just saw an opportunity to, yeah, uh, contribute to something that can be bigger than myself. And I was, uh, uh, I, I guess I was aligned with the thesis of Punk Dow as well, just because uh, I personally like had an opportunity to, uh, you know, buy to board apes pretty early, even to mint. But at the time, I, I was just such a punk maxi that I, I found it like blasphemous that anyone would compare <laughs> anything that, that to punks in terms of like the, the on-chain provenance, the, the story uh, with the founders and uh, yeah, just being like an innovator in our space in general. Uh, so I've always been like a, a punk maxi and think even if like most NFTs die, uh, punks still hold some intrinsic cultural uh, value. So yeah, being that, you know, the secondary, I guess, uh, goal of Punk Dow is actually to just acquire more punks. It, it felt in line with um, kind of how I wanted to spend my time in capital as well. Where, where do you think we go from here, Jack? I know you're um, a, a punk maxi and into NFTs and also an, a really good investor as well. But where, where do you think sort of, you know, what is it? It's, it's May 2024. Um, it's The market's a little bit choppy. ETH NFTs are not super active and super liquid right now, but where, where, where do you think we go from here? Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I think local bottom for ETH is in, and it's like the, the most hated coin on my timeline. Uh, everyone thinks ETH is going to zero, no one's going to use it anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I think it's a good time to, to be uh, buying ETH. NFTs, I'm less sure about. Uh, punks, I have no you know worry about holding, and they, they can be productive assets. You can borrow against your punk with Gandhi. Shout out to Gandhi. That's one of the porcos for us, I believe. Um, and yeah, there's tons of ways you can uh, put your like NFT to work uh, with your punk. So uh, I think of it as like a pretty productive asset that I hold. Um, but for other NFTs, yeah, for the most part, it's dead. Uh, the only like select NFTs that have had some success, I think, have been mostly on the gaming side. And that's purely because there is a expectation of a token airdrop at some point. Um, yeah, I would, beyond that, I, I don't think like PF fees or any of like the generative art is going to make a comeback in like a meaningful way, at least in terms of price. That's not to say um, that there can't be like on-chain innovation, but like the generative NFTs with music NFTs, but I don't know that we'll see the same type of like price uh, or speculation run up for NFTs this cycle as we did last cycle. Yeah, I'm probably in the same boat, which is um, 
which is a bit of a shame. Um, feels like all the uh, the meta's gone to meme coins, um, but but maybe ordinals there could be something there. Um, sort of feel like there's something brewing and bubbling there. But uh, okay, and um, if, for this cycle as well, like how, how are you sort of placing your bets? Like you know, what's your sort of thesis around how this sort of plays out uh, between sort of you know privates and liquids, and 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 what sort of sectors and areas are you sort of um, bullish on? So there's a couple like. I guess like core beliefs that I've held since last cycle. I, I have it like written out publicly um, on like this Notion page that's also doubles as like my portfolio slash website, www.hhjax.xyz. Uh, and one of them is that, you know, credibly neutral block space becomes a really valuable commodity in the future. So I'm bullish on MEV, I'm bullish on ETH itself because it's still the most credibly neutral block space. Um, bullish on account abstraction and have invested uh, in that sector quite a bit. Uh, smart wallets on uh, new primitives that smart wallets enable, uh, things like being able to like trade your wallet or reassign illiquid incentives like points from wallet to wallet. Uh, that I'm pretty interested in as well. There's a, a company I, I recently invested in called Agent that's looking to do that. Um, I think the next phase of DeFi innovation is likely to be driven by like emerging economies, mobile first, uh, or just by anons, just because it seems like the the regulatory uh, stance from the US is just never going to be like friendly uh, to DeFi projects and even infrastructures, uh, infrastructure projects to a certain extent, as we've seen with uh, kind of like the the decisions around like the Eigenlayer token and some of these larger like North American VC backed projects that have uh, basically elected to not airdrop their community all that much, uh, if at all. Uh, I'm personally bullish on like the proliferation of venture DAOs as well, just because I think it's a emergent form of like community-based capital uh, formation. And that is like one thing that I think crypto really has like true PMI for. Uh, it's why I've participated in all of these DAOs. And I, I don't think the world needs, you know, uh, that many more mega uh, multi-billion dollar funds uh, deploying into crypto. There's not that many quality projects for all of that uh, capital to really be, you know, uh, I would say like safely or maybe just uh, intelligently deployed into. Um, I, I think more, you know, sector specific or uh, expertise specific uh, community like venture DAOs make sense uh, for a lot of projects. Uh, you don't, you know, have the overhang of needing some multi-billion dollar venture outcome. But at the same time, you can actually uh, engage with like a group of investors that are passionate about like what you're building and can uh, help support you in some meaningful way, meaningful way as well. Uh, on the gaming side, I, I think rather than like a AAA game with really intense graphics and game logic, the breakout Web3 game is going to be some sort of like consumer lifestyle application that tokenizes the existing trend. Uh, and brings that community on chain by rewarding them for their off chain actions. So uh, there's like a bear chain project called Puff Paul. They're doing Bake to Earn. I think that's pretty interesting. Uh, I've talked to some other projects in the past that wanted to, you know, tokenize religion in some way and do like a pray to earn project. I think those are quite <laughs> interesting as well because ultimately it's like that 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 is a potential uh, network state as well, right? It's a group of people with uh, really strongly held beliefs that. I can be brought together on chain through uh, like capital formation and incentives. That's a, that's a, that's an interesting sort of take as well. I never thought about that. Um, you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, I think the, a lot of these tokens are basically uh, religions in some ways, right? Um, we all get together and and um, and pray for the best for our tokens and uh, build strong bonds over that. Awesome. Um, and then just flipping it back to to punks for a little bit now. Um, uh, if if money wasn't an issue, what would be a dream punk? Do you think? Uh, if money wasn't an issue, I, I probably would want to grab like a alien punk or or maybe a zombie punk. Uh, just I think it's it's like nice for the historical significance. And I've seen uh, aliens and zombies like printed out on like a nice piece of uh, uh uh, paper and like framed in the office and they look quite nice. I, I like the vibe. <laughs> so I, I think that would be uh, the goal if money was no issue. Gotcha. Um, 
and then uh, what what are you are you collecting much these days or are you just sitting on your sitting in your bags or yeah uh, I, I'm collecting a bit cautiously uh, so I am uh, like decently sized holder of uh, pirate nation founder pirates I'm pretty bullish on that team uh, just because they've done it before uh, with farm bill uh, they're you know I think building and leaning into all the right narratives in terms of like a, a fully on chain game, uh, also building their own uh, app chain uh, called Proof of Play and potentially launching other IPs on that chain. Uh, so pretty bullish on the pirates, try to play, you know, every day, keep my streak going. Uh, on Solana, I unfortunately uh, rotated a lot of like my early mean point profits into uh, Mad Lads and Tensorians and have been staking my Tensorians. So that hasn't turned out as well, but I'm I'm hopeful for like the Solana NFT comeback. And if they do come back, I I don't see like better bets than uh, those two projects as far as like blue chips at least. Um, there's another like interesting NFT project that also doubles as like a the NFTs double as like an entry into the investment DAO. It's called the uh, Cyborg DAO keys. Um, this one's kind of cool. It's like a, a DAO that you know raised a bit of money. Um, and they are the largest collector of uh, AI AI NFTs, pretty much um, uh, in the world right now. So I believe they hold most of the uh, artwork that was generated by the Bado project, uh, if you remember that one. Um, but yeah, that's a that's another one that uh, I have a bit of exposure in, just in case there's like a I don't know an uh, AI NFT. Uh, narrative that pops off or something. Yeah, it's, I think this one that one's been pretty hot, right? I, I don't, I don't know sh I'm not sure if you've seen the Align Draw um, AI NFTs. That was like, uh, I mean, they've had a bit of a run in this sort of bear market as well. So uh, I think AI will definitely ha catch a bit this, this uh, cycle. Um, cool. Oh, and what about um, some art pieces and stuff like that? Do you collect much um, gen art? I know you said you minted. Um, uh, Pedenzas and uh, and some ringers, uh, um, swiggles. Um, but are you, are you collecting much gen art as well? Honestly, not really. I I have like pieces from the past, so I have like uh, a couple ex copy pieces, Guzzler, um, and a few others. But nothing as of late, to be honest. Have been focusing a lot more, uh, I think, on the token side and on make points than I have been uh, on NFTs. And the NFTs that I have collected are mostly uh, gaming related, whether it's like in the Prime ecosystem or uh, related to uh, Pioneer Nations with proof, proof of play. And if you, if you look back at your NFT sort of career, what's your, um, what's your sort of best win and, and worst loss? Yeah, uh, so best wins... Mm. Uh, probably the punks that I bought early on was one of them. Uh, loot, I minted a ton for free uh, during the Genesis event uh, where you had to like, you know, go on either scan and basically guess <laughs> uh, guess uh, numbers and hope that, you know, uh, you guess the right one or you guess an unminted number uh, to be able to uh, mint the loot NFT. And then from loot, uh, that went into A gold and then treasure, which I then staked for magic. So the loot to treasure to magic uh, journey was probably the, the best NFT win uh, I had end to end because that was, I guess, like purely free, uh, no upfront capital spent. I, I, missed, I missed all of that. I, I might've gotten to the beanies blue and then got absolutely wrecked in that one, but um, I missed the original one. Nice. And, and um, how would you describe punk culture for you? Yeah, for me, uh, I think it's, if I had to put it in like, one word description it's, it's like being uh, a maverick being an outlier and uh just willing to uh, be bold and go against the grain that's part of punk culture and also being uh open to discussion and discourse and uh, even feedback yeah and um and how do you feel about v1 punks yeah i i don't know to be honest i i think value uh, just like attraction is in like the eye of the beholder. So certainly uh, there's nothing wrong with, you know, people that value those B1 punks. But I think just with the way that things have turned out in, in terms of like both 
off-chain and on-chain history and where the punk IP is now, how it's uh, kind of being at least uh, uh, kept safe by the folks over at Yuga. Uh, I think it's a hard argument to, uh, you know, try try to claim that the V1 punks should be worth more uh, than the current pop collection. And what about um, Yuga's involvement with punks? How do you how do you sort of feel about that? Yeah, in, initially pretty negative. Uh, I was like, you know, why? Why would they sell out to Yuga? Uh, and you know, as I mentioned before, wasn't a fan of the Apes to be honest. So was fairly bearish on the decision. But honestly, through you know joining Punk Dao and having the opportunity to speak with the liaisons over at Yuga, it does seem like they they have like the best in mind for the Punk IP, and they're not planning to you know do anything weird or tarnish it or try to extract value from it in like a weird way. So I guess like okay with the Yuga ownership at the moment. Uh, I my only like kind of open question is mm, how can we encourage and incentivize more of like the Web three builder community to like build on top of and use the Punk IP uh, a bit more freely without having to worry about uh, well Yuga shut shut us down if you know this is competitive or if this infringes upon you know something else that they're doing. Um, that's one thing that I would, you know, love to try to get more clarity on, love to, uh, try to support in some way in terms of just more folks, uh, building on top of Punk's IP. Uh, but other than that, seems to me like they've been like pretty good stewards, uh, of the punks thus far. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. N Natalie and, and the team do uh, a great job and very thoughtful about how they've been approaching it without, um, you know, coming across as super extractive and corporate. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, just going back to your 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 point around um not a fan of bored apes like what what was it about the apes that sort of triggered you uh i think it was the art it was the art and also maybe like the early community that the apes attracted versus the community that the punks attracted uh I felt like the punk community and the punks i had met were always uh like generally you know thoughtful uh perhaps like uh more like soft spoken or even level headed uh, folks that were, you know, building something full, uh, in it for the tech or in it for the art. Whereas most of the early ape holders I, I met, uh, and this is maybe just personal experience, but were more, I guess, like hype beasts or folks that were more into like, uh, trading or profit maxis at the time. So at least for me, I, I felt like I identified a bit more with the punk community, uh, than what I observed to be the, the ape community, uh, at the time that they you know, Lasha were still pretty big. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, I did feel a little bit of that too in the early days. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's this this pros and cons of of each each collection too. But um, fair, fair points, Jack. This was super fun. Uh, just one last question, I guess, before we we sort of uh, call it a day. But um, if you could pass on a message to the next owner of your punk five three zero nine, what would you like to say to them? You know, I, I think I'd keep it simple. I tell them to keep going and keep learning because throughout, you know, uh, the ups and downs of the market uh, of life in general, I think the, the one thing that's worked for me is uh, to be consistent and to have grit and to keep going uh, when the going gets, gets tough, especially in, in the crypto market. I, I don't think I'm necessarily like the smartest person, the most talented person, the most connected person, uh, but I never, you know, gave up on the space. I stuck around in the bear market. I continue to go to conferences, continue to learn, continue to keep up with new narratives, uh, new developments, new trends. And it's worked out pretty well uh, for me. So for the next owner, my punk guy would say the same, just keep going and keep learning. Amazing. Jack, thank you so much for joining Punkcast. Um, and hopefully we can connect at one of these conferences soon. And uh, guys, that wraps up an episode of Punkcast for the week. And uh, we'll be back next week with another amazing punk. Bye for now. Bye.